Hello everybody and welcome to another unsupervised machine learning tutorial video. In this video what we're going to be talking about is hierarchical clustering, classification, whatever you want to call it. Basically what's going to be happening here is in the last video we did clustering but we told the machine how many clusters we wanted it to make. In this video we're going to be talking about how to let the machine choose how many clusters it thinks is the most applicable. So uh, with that let's go ahead and get started. So First we're going to import NumPy as NP. We're going to be using NumPy really only for one function now. We're not going to actually be converting to an array uh, for reasons I'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, next we're going to go from sklearn.cluster import mean shift and we're going to import mean shift as ms. Then what we're going to go ahead and do is from sklearn.datasets.samples underscore generator import make underscore blobs. So what we're going to have to do here is we're not going to be able to be using the same data set that we've used up to this point for a sample because it only has six data points. And six data points is too few data points to use with mean shift. It's really too few to use anywhere, but uh, it's just worked for us up until this point, but it's not possible to do it with mean shift. So anyways, we're going to make our own sample. And what this is going to do is it's going to exactly what it sounds like. It's going to make blobs of data based on you know standard deviation, a little bit of randomness. It's going to make blobs of data around a point that you specify and you'll say how many blobs you are, you know, how many data points you want around that point. And then also you'll get, you can specify the standard deviation. So, uh, that's what we're going to use that for. And then finally, we're going to import mapplotlib.pyplot as PLT so that we can actually visualize our data. So now we're going to go ahead and say the following. We're going to specify a centers variable, and it's going to be a list of lists. Now, for now, we'll just have two uh, data points to start with. We'll use a 1 and a 1, and we'll use a 5 and a 5. So those are our center points. Now we're going to specify x and a lowercase y. And if you happen to see any other tutorials on this topic, you may see people do x comma underscore here. And the reason why they're doing that is this, this from SK Learn dataset sample generator, what it's going to do for you is actually two things. It de generates sample data, but not just any sample data. It's specific to machine learning. And it's generalized data for either unsupervised or supervised machine learning. So what it's going to do is it's going to come with labels. So whenever you see this underscore like this when we're unpacking variables, it means pay no attention. It's useless in this example, basically. I'm going to call it Y because that's what it is and that's how it relates to the other videos in the past. But just understand that the reason why people might underscore it is to kind of underscore. <laughs> the importance of understanding that normally you do not have labeled data. So I don't know. Maybe I'll just leave it there, actually. I don't It doesn't matter. Just understand what, what that purpose is. So anyways, make blobs. I love that joke, underscore. Oh, man, so funny. And to make blobs, you're going to say how many blobs you want. Uh, so n underscore samples. This will be how many blobs do we want to create. Let's make 100. Just for the record, mean shift is thought to be accurate up to... 10,000 samples. More than that, you're in trouble. So if you have data that's bigger than 10,000 samples, you're going to need some way to simplify that down. Uh, you can actually use use uh, use you can actually use machine learning for that, specifically even unsupervised machine learning, but maybe more on that later. For now, our number of samples we're going to say is 200. Then centers is going to equal well centers. And then finally, cluster underscore standard deviation is going to be one for now. So this is our uh, function we're unpacking to a variable that doesn't matter, and of course x, which is our data set. Now what we can do is we can go plt.scatter, and we can scatter using that fancy code that we learned. So capital X, colon, comma, one. And then finally run a plt.show on the data. Whoops. And we will save and run that. And here we have our lovely data set that, you know, with your eyeballs, you can say, okay, 
this is a cluster here, and this is a cluster here. Now, we want the computer to make that choice, and we're hoping that it really does indeed say this is a cluster, and this is a cluster, and it doesn't say, well, here's a cluster here, and here's another cluster, and another cluster, and then here's another cluster. We don't want that. We're hoping it doesn't do that. So anyway, closing out of this, uh, I'm going to comment this out. We don't need this anymore, but if you want to look at it, that's totally fine. Now, um, and in fact, maybe I'll leave it up for the first time running because it'll be a scatter plot of the same data non-colored because we're going to end up coloring it. Now, we've got, uh, we're going to reference ms for mean shift. So now we're going to say ms.fit, and we're going to fit a capital X there. Now what we're going to say is the labels equals ms.labels underscore. Now, please don't confuse these labels with these labels. These are the actual labels that were used in the generation of the data set. These labels are the labels that the machine has assigned to the data. So later on, of course, you could compare these labels to these labels. But I will just say that that might be useless as far as generating any sort of performance. Because, for example, if we put these two centers close enough, like say we generate with a two and a two, standard deviation is one, therefore we're going to have some crossover that could be justifiably so more related to this than this. That's just the case. So just keep that in mind that if you've got enough standard deviation in your samples, even if they come pre-labeled and then you're using that to test uh, your unsupervised clustering algorithm, just understand that it's, it's going to do what it thinks is best, and if the data, even though it was generated with an initial 2-2, two, two, if the variance is enough, it makes more sense to be clustered with the 1-1. One, one. So keep that in mind. Moving along, uh, those are labels. Now we're going to do cluster underscore centers, and these are going to equal the ms.cluster underscore centers underscore. So these will be the actual, like the centroids, only not so much, but these will be the... Um, the estimated centers. So again, it will be interesting to see how closely the computer predicts the cluster centers to what the actual cluster centers were. In theory, the higher we make the samples variable and the lower the standard deviation is, the more accurate this valuation will be in relation to the true starting number. Moving on. Uh, now we're gonna have n, uh, n underscore clusters. And the number of clusters is going to equal the length of the np.unique. And what the np.unique functionality does is it looks at an array and it tells you how many unique variables there are. Not what the unique variables are, but how many exist. So np.unique, and then we want that to be run on labels. And this will tell us how many categories or cluster types the machine has returned to us. Now what we want to go ahead and do is we're just going to print this out and we're going to say number of estimated clusters and we're just going to have that be n clusters underscore. So that just returns to us how many numbers or how many clusters, the number of how many clusters uh, there are. Now we're going to specify a list of colors for plotting. It'll be very similar to what we had used before. So we'll just kind of make a list that we're about to populate now. We're going to do R period for red green period for green, or G period for green, B period for blue, uh, then we've got C period for cyan, K period uh, for black, W or Y period uh, for yellow, and then we'll do M period for magenta. Now, it's totally possible that we have more than these uh, many clusters, so just to make sure that doesn't be the, it, that doesn't become the problem, we're going to do 10 times. And what this is going to do is just make this list 10 times as big as it is. It'll just be repeating over itself. That way we won't run out of colors to choose from. Hopefully, if we have more than 70 categories, something long. So moving right along, we're going to go ahead and just so you can visualize what's happened there in case you haven't followed, you can print out colors. And then we'll also print out labels so we understand it's just it's a one-dimensional array. Now, we're going to do pretty similar code to what you've seen before in the previous video. So none of this should be too too new. So we're going to say for i in range of the length of capital X. So basically for i in the range of this cluster data that we you know, 
generated, what do we want to do? And we have the labels that the machine has chosen uh, in a list, so that will be a list of equal length to x, so we'll know what the corresponding label was, and then that label will be either a 0 or a 1, so then we can call, or a 2 or a 3, I suppose, if it incorrectly decides that there's more clusters than there are. Uh, and then we'll use that number and apply it to this list to pick what color to chart it in. So for i in len of x, we are going to plt.plot. And again, using similar syntax as before, the x or the i of the x, the zeroth of the i -th of the x. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> x i and 1. And then we'll say colors labels i. And that will be the, you know, one of these in this list, basically. Again, this is all similar syntax to before, so hopefully you're still following there. And then marker size will equal 10. And that's it for this for loop. We don't really need to do anything else. We could print out the coordinate and the label like we did before, but we have 200 samples, so I don't really want to do that. Next, we're going to spl uh, plot and scatter the center marker, right? So we've got cluster centers, kind of like centroids, not the same thing, but kind of like centroids, cluster centers here. And so we're going to go plt.scatter, and we're going to scatter the cluster centers. And this will be using similar code that you've seen, so colon, comma, zero, comma. And then I'm just going to copy this, so we don't have to type that all out again. And that now we'll use the number one. Then we're going to say, uh, we'll hit enter here after that comma. Don't forget your comma before you hit enter there. Uh, marker equals an x. And the size will be 150. The line widths width will be 5. And the z order will equal 10. Finally, we run plot.show. Save and run it. And we wait a moment, hopefully not too long, for it to pop up. It took a while just to uh, load there. And here is the initial plot with the data. So we can see, OK, we categorize this and this. But we're not really sure about what to do with these center points. Uh, we'll close out of this. Ah, Did we not even put in a positional argument in there? Well, we sure did. We put in the uh, fit x there. Uh, fit x. I'm looking at it. Um, let me try the following. Huh? Um, we'll say ms equals uh, mean shift as follows. Let's try this one more time. There we are. OK, so now we've got the plot. These were the center points. Now, this time I was mostly testing it. So we'll run this one more time, and I'll explain what, what just happened, I suppose. Um, so this was, I suppose, attempting to import it as ms, and we were having a little bit of problem there because we didn't. We wanted to actually run it, run the function itself. Uh, so that was kind of our problem. So it's this function dot fit as opposed to just ms dot fit. So anyway, uh, so now what we're going to go ahead and do is we'll run that one more time, have this pop up for us. And so again, here's our two clusters, and here's a center point that I would not know <laughs> where to apply that. Uh, so anyway, we'll close this and we'll see what the machine says. Okay, well the machine says it's part of this cluster here. Uh, interestingly enough, we can move this uh, over here and we can see, okay, sure, the number of clusters is two that it suggests. Ah, I meant to plot or uh, print out the center points. Uh, let's close out of this. And let me, right here, we're going to print cluster underscore centers. So now we can actually compare that to these centers. Let's raise up the number of samples as well. So this is the data. We'll close this. And it runs the test, fits, and all of that. And here we have a group here and another group here. And now let's see what the centroids were. Well, we've got a 0.95 and a 1.12 and a 4.9 and a 5.00. So yeah, that's pretty darn close to the initial 1155. Now, what happens if we, for example, say, um, let's do 3, 8, run that again. So here we've got what appears to maybe be a blob, but we can totally see how the center point could be right about there. Let's see what the machine says. 
And indeed, the machine agreed with me that that looks like it mostly is all one big blob, and this is a second blob. Now, there are uh, some ways that we can tell the machine, hey, we want you to kind of be a little more um, specific in your categories, or you want to be more, uh, and like we would call this maybe a blob and this part of that blob. And this is pretty clearly a blob because there's even white space between them. But we can use it to create uh, more, just like a more tight threshold, basically. Uh, there's a lot of parameters that we can adjust here, and you can see why that becomes necessary. Let's do uh, 310 and see what, the, what this one does. So this is a little more defined. I can see clearly three center points there, so hopefully it gives us three. And sure enough, it does, although the blue X, we cannot really see where the blue X is. That was kind of a silly idea. What were you guys thinking? Anyway, uh, so now we've got these, these groups here. Uh, so uh, we can see that it, it indeed chose right. I mean, obviously, this point could have been from this point. Uh, and all that, but for the most part, we can definitely see that this looks as we would expect. Uh, and sure enough, one, one, five, five, and three, ten, uh, and that is exactly what we had pretty much chosen. So we can see that that seems to have worked pretty well. But of course, we can always fool it by increasing standard deviation and getting the following. So how would you group this, <laughs> right? What are you gonna do? Uh, maybe you know apply this as an outlier or something like that. Uh, we'll see what the machine says. Right. So the machine says, okay, this is clearly an outlier. These guys are closer to this little guy over here. So it says, yep, so that that's a, a point of its own. And then everyone else is the same. So obviously, there's when it comes to this, there's a lot of tweaking that's required depending on what kind of data set you have. Um, so, and, and that only makes the most sense. What we're doing is we're throwing data at the machine and we're basically letting it do everything. So it only makes sense that this is the more complex <laughs> version of machine learning. Um, and let's, let's do a 0 0.3 just for, just for kicks. So obviously that's pretty clear. Um, and yeah, it's right on the ball pretty much. And again, you can see that accuracy as far as picking the center point is pretty darn high just simply because, um, of like what I was saying, the standard deviation went down. And if we rose number of samples to a higher number, uh, it would only be even more accurate. Anyway, uh, that's it for the basics of this. Like I said, as you can see, this is only going to get more and more complicated, especially when it comes to unsupervised machine learning and allowing the machine pretty much full ability to determine you know what is actually different uh, in the in the data so uh, we can see that it, it can be quite accurate and it's very good if you feed it the correct amount of data and later on we'll talk maybe a little bit more about some of the parameters that you can specify especially in mean shift here uh, as well there's a lot of default parameters that we haven't covered so anyways basic covering of it pretty cool stuff if you ask me but um, but yeah, there's definitely a whole lot more to cover here. So anyways, if you guys have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support and subscriptions. And until next time. Hey everybody, what is going on? I just want to let you know that I do plan to make a sort of project-based example with unsupervised learning, kind of like we did with supervised learning, as well as the meshing of the two for a more of a semi-supervised machine learning. And there's actually quite a few more machine learning algorithms that we have to choose from with scikit-learn. So obviously the topic of machine learning is just massive. So for now, I'm going to be taking a break from it. We've been doing this basically for a month straight here. So I'm going to be taking a break for uh, from this for now because not all my subscribers are interested in machine learning. But I am coming back to it because I am interested in machine learning. So have no fear, it will be back. And whenever there are more videos, there will be a link in this video. If you have annotations turned on as usual, you will just need to click on it. Otherwise, I'll add it to the playlist, which is also, there's a link in the description for that.